Yeah, but we have to sit close like this here. I do not hear you. Oh, sorry. Are they, is it rolling? Yeah. Yeah, it's rolling. Okay. Oh yeah, she wants to close the door. I always felt that I was the inventor of cinema. You see, because I never saw any films when, when I was, until I was 11. A traveling projectionist came to this little schoolhouse where there were 20 children and showed, uh, showed two films, which didn't impress me at all. But until then, I did not even know that cinema existed. This is so dumb, I've never seen anything as dumb as that. Turner, it's pathetic. Either you shoot this shot, or I'm gonna shoot you, okay? Not long ago, I made a film in the cinematographer. He said to me, but Werner, we, are, we don't do that like this. And, and I said, what, what do you mean by we do not do it like this? He said, nobody does it like this. In, in filmmaking, I said, uh, really? Uh, and I thought for a moment, I said, well, let's do it anyway, because we are the inventors of cinema. We invent the rules. We invent the procedures. We invent the content. So in, in a way, it's, of course, it's, it, sounds, it sounds crazy and uh, as if I was not completely right in my head. But fundamentally, there's a basis where I always feel, yes, I still have to invent cinema. There's only one village, and that's where I grew up. All the others I do not really know, so that was the center of the world for me. And of course, uh, Bavaria uh, is part of Germany now, but it used to be an independent state, a kingdom, and has its own dialect. It's like in China, you have uh, regional dialects and you have mountain people and you have uh, all sorts of cultures. There's no uniform Chinese culture. And of course in Germany, there are regional cultures. And I grew up in, in a very small village which was safe from the bombardments. I made my first telephone call when I was 17. That's what young people today uh, find very exotic. They cannot understand, yeah. We had shoes only in winter, but it was a very beautiful childhood. Uh, very secluded and really, really good. I was very lucky. <laughs> Both mother and father uh, were PhDs. Uh, so, uh, but of course we lived among peasants because we fled when the bombs came down in the, on Munich. The bombs came down when I was only two weeks old. I was 14 days old when my mother found me in my cradle with a thick layer of glass shards and bricks on me, but I was unhurt. So, but she was frightened and fled. So uh, I, I, I grew up among peasants, but uh, I, I do not come from a peasant family. 
and I worked in a steel factory, but I do not come from a working uh, class family. But I must say, after the war, after the war, it did not matter what your background was. Everything was destroyed. Seven, 715 cities in Germany were annihilated. Munich was hit not so hard, it was something may, maybe 80% destroyed. But there were other cities that were completely, completely erased. And for everyone, the li life was the same. So uh, poverty, hunger, um, absence of the men, absence of fathers, which in my case was good. I always liked to, I, I loved it that there was no father around to uh, commandeer me around and tell me how to behave. So my older brother and I immediately started to re-educate our mother. So we were the educators not the parents. And uh, we, started, uh, we started to earn money very soon. And I earned uh, money for just for making films later. Uh, she downloaded it from a website and she yeah. printed it out. Oh, yeah. okay, and okay. Uh, yet we do not know who yeah. made it. <laughs> okay. uh, she doesn't know who made it. Uh, yeah. No, she t took it from the website. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, you know, noch ein Foto und dann finish. Uh, I've seen a feature film in cinemas, which was very well accepted by audiences, and it was shot on a cell phone and edited on a laptop. I always have the feeling. When I started, everybody complained, ah, it's so difficult to uh, make movies, nobody wants to finance my project. I said, finance it yourself. Yeah, how? Just earn the money and then do it. And today I tell young students, uh, I do not accept the culture of complaint. It's, it's an attitude that I do not like and they sit and wait until the money is coming and it can take six, seven, eight, ten years. And I make two or three films a year. Just uh, go out and take the initiative and do it. I believe that it's good to start early, to grow up with your films. It's like with a chess player, you have to play chess at age five. Or when you play a music instrument, you start early, grow up with it. If you make films, try to start early. And that's why I think uh, film students very often are too long in the, under the shelter of the film school. I always tell students, uh, look out for longer term survival as a filmmaker. Statistically speaking, as an average, we have 14, 15, 16 years in the in the profession and then everybody somehow disappears. I think it's a correct word because I have taken risks, yes, but not, not stupid risks. You see, uh, I have taken uh, very well balanced and very well calculated risks. But of course I have taken risks that no other filmmaker would do. Nobody would move a big ship over a mountain. Nobody would make a film with all the actors under hypnosis. Uh, nobody would do uh, uh, a film on a volcano that was about to explode. Nobody would make a film in a, in a war zone 
where they would shoot at you. But you you have to be you have to be streetwise, you have to be prudent. You see, if I never went out for risks, people think ah yeah, I'm seeking risks. No, no. I'm the I'm very, very professional and I can evaluate risks. And and if it's uh, if it is too risky, I do not go into it. If I describe, if I create a, a madman like Aguirre, uh, it doesn't mean that I'm mad. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely sane, you can take my word. Yes, uh, I went through rapids, but I passed through all sorts of rapids, rapids to test them. They should be spectacular, but they should be just uh, in such a way that we could do it, that we would not uh, put a real danger uh, out there for anyone. And only after I was there alone, um, then I told the crew, this is the situation, everybody who wants to stay behind can stay behind, but they all followed me and nothing happened. All right, number one, you're gonna have to walk in one simple direction, and I'm gonna keep the rope. Pull on one rope for me. Pull out. Well, movies is never a safe place, and I mean uh, intellectually, it is not safe, because you never know what is coming at you, and you have to to react, and you have to make something out and out of an, an impossible situation. And in my case. Um, yes, I have had a lot of adversity, like in Fitzcarraldo. The leading actor becomes so ill that he uh, has, uh, drops out of the film and I have to shoot it all over again. I shot it one and a half times. And I had two plane crashes. And I was, ran into a border war between Peru and Ecuador. And my camp for 1,100 people was burned to the ground. And I was shot at and I uh, was uh, put in prison and I, in Africa, in a civil war situation. And so these things happen, but uh, there's nothing wrong about it. This is the situation. We have a, one of our small planes somehow disappeared and crashed somewhere. What do we do? As a filmmaker, you have to, to learn to accept what, whatever is thrown at me, I'm dealing with it instantly. You see, you cannot hide. You are the one who has to step forward. Christian Bale, in a film called Rescue Dawn, had to eat live maggots. And he had to eat it. And I said, uh, Christian, give me the spoon. I will eat and show you that it's okay. Well, I have sometimes, in a few cases, worked with uh, uh, unconventional actors, uh, but uh, I have worked with the best of the best uh, of the professionals, like Christian Bale or Nicolas Cage or Nicole Kidman or now uh, Michael Shannon, for example who is probably the best of his generation, and uh, Donald Sutherland and Kinski and Claudia Cardinale. So I've worked a lot with real, real, uh, very fine professionals. But um, sometimes the ones who um, have not been in the profession are, are also very intense, very profound, like Bruno in uh, The Enigma of Caspar Hauser. He'd never been um, in a film before, and yet uh, he has this aura, an aura of tragedy around him that is, that is totally visible in, on the screen. He, he was actually the best of the best with whom I worked. And he was not, he was not a professional actor, in fact. Uh, a very tragic man who uh, had been locked away all his childhood and, uh, and his adolescence in 
in asylums for uh, insane children and for, I mean, catastrophic, catastrophic life. And yet he has uh, a radical human dignity that you do not see on the screen. There, there is talk about school of acting. That's pretty much nonsense. Do not, do not believe anyone. All the rest is nonsense and they only charge a lot of money of very stupid young people who think they become actors. It's an embarrassment. Since I see a whole film fairly clearly, I would write a screenplay like in a week. I simply uh, wrote it this way because I had no idea how a screenplay looked like. Until today, I, I keep the uh, film completely open for, uh, for life to invade. All the great Chinese poets did not go to poetry classes. I personally do not believe um, in, in screenwriting techniques and screenwriting uh, uh, structures. To describe my fascination about Chinese culture, we, we would need a week to sit together and look through uh, poetry and look through paintings and look through um, uh, old characters uh, in Chinese writing. But the same thing I would ask of you, uh, be curious about other world cultures. Don't isolate yourself. Uh, think with the, with the mind of others. See with the eyes of others. That will give you much more clarity for your own vision. For others like Ingmar Bergman, it would be a face, a human face. In my case, uh, sometimes uh, landscapes are the, the center of a film. The signs of life. Uh, there was a central image uh, that I had seen when I was 15 or 16 years old uh, on a Greek island. And uh, I was on foot in the mountains and I looked down into a valley and there were 10,000 windmills. The image was uh, dormant, was sleeping inside my soul. And 10 years later, when I was 25, I made this film. And this is, has a magnet in it. It probably disturbs the yeah. microphone. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the world, the digital world, uh, is. Um, in a way, misleading filmmakers. They keep the camera rolling. <coughs> they keep it rolling for hours and hours. Uh, instead of stopping it, resuming it, improving it. So you should know very well in advance what you are doing. Normally, I would um, look into the daily cash flow. This sounds terribly bureaucratic and uninspired. But because of that, uh, after 50 years, I still make films. I would not allow cell phones on my set, not next to the camera. Sounds strange, I do not want to have video play out of what we are filming. Because the entire team is distracted by the screens and not focusing on what is going on with the actors, for example. It, it is also good that you are filming something and you don't know exactly um, the result, the immediate result. 
only with a night in between. Uh, your footage all of a sudden um, shows you its real qualities. This is not Photoshop. This is not a Photoshop. Can you try to pen somebody to translate this? This is not Photoshop. Today I can work faster uh, because I'm editing digitally and I can edit very, very fast. Almost as fast as I'm thinking. I'm exaggerating now, but a film like Grizzly Man which is a big film, uh, almost two hours long, and I edited the film in nine days. And I think uh, colleagues of mine would have edited uh, nine months, ten months, eleven months. That I do not like the ultra crisp sort of lenses, and I do not like uh, very much 4K cameras for human faces, for close-up. There's a... When I see your face, I see your face in totality. And I see it uh, uh, with uh, your interest and your sympathy and your knowledge. I, I see a composite of a face. But the cameras that are over-precise give you a dermatological report of the skin of somebody. You, you, you know what I mean. You, all of a sudden you see every single impurity and every single little hair in the face and, and it's very distracting. I want to see a face uh, uh, in its totality like, let's say, the Hollywood films in the 1930s or 40s. There was something softer about it, something less precise. So, uh, and I try to make my choice accordingly. And I try to avoid uh, zoom lenses. I do not like zoom lenses because um, when I'm uh, so fascinated about a situation or about someone, I would not zoom in on your face. I would physically move in with my camera. Physically, I'm so curious that I move in close. That's very really good. I keep eating too much. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's always coming by and... It's like smart dishes? Yeah, yeah. Are we going out here? Yeah. Uh, film students, I've seen it in, in America, they say, ah, we want the newest camera and, uh, and only if we have the very state of the art newest camera, then we can make a real film. And I say, no, uh, the, uh, that doesn't make any film better. You show me first with a, with a wooden box and a tiny hole drilled in it and a photographic plate show me that you can make a photo without camera, without lens, uh, with a, a pinhole camera. Show me a photo that you have made. Make your own pinhole camera and then I will give you a, a camera in your hand and it shouldn't be the 4K or 5K camera. It should be an average camera and you work with that. The digital world doesn't change uh, the films, it only changes our connectivity. But um, we do not need to be connected to the world to make a film. That would be a wrong assumption. Um, but of course, uh, 
that the digital world has uh, given us easier tools, less expensive tools, faster tools. That's all about that. Uh, it doesn't make, having the internet doesn't make any better films. We only have new forms, let's say, of distribution. We can distribute our films through streaming and we do it via the internet. And we can even have a film festival on the internet. And, uh, but it, it doesn't fundamentally change what filmmaking is all about. We have to stay away from uh, thinking too much digitally. I made uh, a documentary not long ago, a few years ago, about a horrifying murder case where a little girl who was one and a half years old was uh, murdered in the most horrible uh, form of crime. And when I made the film, by mistake, they kept a few photos of the little girl for me to see. And it, I, uh, it was really shocking. What I have seen, nobody, nobody should ever uh, be forced to see. Nobody should see what I've seen. But my point is, I, I woke up in the middle of the night because I heard a loud scream. And it turns out the scream came from me. There was a plan to do more films about uh, uh, some very, very um, horrifying crimes, and I stopped to do them. You, you, there has to be a balance, there has to be an economy there has to be an economy between life and cinema. I'm careful to, to see too many connections and um, exchanges of ideas here and there. It's, it's some, something that happens very often in film studies. They try to uh, establish connections and cultural similarities here and there, but uh, I do not function like this. Uh, because in a way, I have created my own world. That's quite obvious, you can see that. Um, until today, for example, I have no cell phone. Uh, and I don't like it for cultural reasons, I do not like it. I'm not nostalgic. nostalgic. Or um, I um, uh, have traveled on foot. Everybody is going by car, everybody takes planes, so do I, but the real, real, real important things in my life I do on foot. So, for example, if you, uh, if you are in love with, uh, with a woman and you want to live with her and you want to have a family with her and you want to have children, and let's say she lives uh, far away uh, in, let's say, Urumqi, <laughs> really far away. Uh, you do not make a phone call or do, you do not send her a Facebook uh, message or so. As a, as a man, you come on foot, 3,000 kilometers, you come on foot and you ask her, uh, will she marry you? Okay. The, the most intense moments in my life, I would never have a, a camera with me. Let's say a photo camera, a, a, a video camera. I was uh, at the birth of two of my children and everybody, my friends asked me, ah, did you take photos? No, I did not. Uh, you, you, you are witness, but uh, you keep cinema, you keep photos out of it. Well, I at least. Uh, people always uh, talk to me and they say, ah, you are an artist. Uh, and I say, no, I don't feel comfortable that you call me an artist. 
and they ask me, what are you then? And my answer is, I'm a soldier. I have made films since I'm 19. Uh, until today, I do not know what my last film will be. I'm working uh, on two films right now. I'm in the middle of it, uh, and which my last one will be, I do not know. Maybe tomorrow they carry me out feet first. That may happen. When we look at our world and when we look at ourselves, we, we can uh, very quickly understand that we are very fragile. The human, human beings are very fragile. And we have not been very long here on this planet. It could happen that we disappear fairly soon from this planet, that we'll go extinct. You? Yeah, yeah. But you, you go back to LA and no, no, to no. Tokyo now? Tomorrow I fly to Tokyo oh, and wow. I start filming. So, courage, courage. Okay, yeah. good night, bye bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs> the most urgent disaster that mankind may face. Okay, the biggest disaster of the human race is if all the batteries run out. Uh, of every cell phone in the world.